from Kansas State University. This is Agriculture Today. Eric Atkinson here. Here's what's ahead. K-State's Jeff Whitworth joins us to discuss those huge armyworm infestations that have been turning up around Kansas in recent weeks and the potential threat they pose to cool season grass and alfalfa stands and potentially to newly planted wheat stands nearby. He offers his advice on whether an insecticide treatment would be worthwhile. Also today, the latest FSA Coffee Talk. Over from the Farm Service Agency, Josh Ritter. He'll provide the latest on the USDA's Farm Storage Facility Loan Program for financing commodity storage construction. And later on, with another Stop, Look, and Listen, K-State's Gus Vanderhoven, plus more right here on Agriculture Today. You're tuned in to the Wednesday edition of Agriculture Today. Well, we're after the latest on the crop insect front now as we visit via phone with crop entomologist Jeff Whitworth of K-State Research and Extension heading into what we hope are the waning days of summer and now transitioning into fall, Jeff. But want to reflect on something that's been... (laughs) more or less a newsmaker in Kansas the last several weeks, as a matter of fact, and whether it uh, does transcend to crop fields, that is this flood of worms, army worms primarily, that uh, folks have reported in their home lawns and just about everywhere else. Are these something of worry in as far as our field crops? Oh, yes. Uh, We have seen and heard about more worms this year, I think, and I was just looking back uh, earlier this week. It's been 14 or 15 years since we've gotten this many reports and looked at this much worm-infested acreage in the state of Kansas. It has happened before. It will happen again. But this year, it has really been annoying to a lot of growers. Uh, We've had army worms, the true army worms, for the most part, fall army worms, and now we're starting to see a few beet army worms. But it all started last February and March with army cutworms. We had pretty good infestations of army cutworms early on. They're they're the first worms that start bugging us, uh, pun intended, in the late winter, early spring. And then they all pack up and head to the Colorado Rocky Mountains for the summer. And then we get other worms. And in this case, army worms, they started affecting wheat and brome. Uh, mainly in the eastern third of the state. And since oh, June, July, they are slowly transitioning. A lot of folks wouldn't say slowly, but they are transitioning throughout the state in a westward march. The army worm, they actually prefer grasses, and that can be corn, sorghum, wheat, fescue, or brome, any, any kind of a grass. They prefer that, but that doesn't mean they will limit them their diet to that. They will actually infest broadleaves like soybeans and alfalfa and other crops also. And the fall army worm generally prefers broadleaves like alfalfa and soybeans, but they will also infest wheat or sorghum or soybeans or other crops. So we we have seen a real problem this year. I don't know what the weather conditions are that are conducive to both army worms and fall army worms and earlier army cutworms, but whatever it is, it's, it has really allowed them to flourish this year. You say, though, Jeff, the primary consideration at the moment is what sorts of ill effects these army worms could inflict on those brome fields out there. The first question I get is on especially brome, if they're feeding on brome, will that kill out the stand? Mm-hmm. Usually not. All of these worms have chewing mouth parts, so they're they're not injecting any toxins or any they're not vectors of any diseases. They just chew off the green leaf part for the most part. So, you know, I get a lot of questions about why is so much brown left out there in the brome where they went by, killed all this grass. They didn't really kill them; they just eaten all the green, and so there's some of the thatch or, or the residue left over on the ground. That brings up some of the, some of the guys asking if, if burning 
will work. It, it does. If if you you know if that's in your management plan to burn your pasture uh, when the worms are out, that's a good good way of getting rid of them. Just as good as spraying them with an insecticide, get rid of all that old patch, and you know allow that green growth to come up. But that's up to each individual's management plan. But the brown that's left is just what the worms are not eating. They're just eating the green part. We've brought them in and tried to feed them, you know, three or four day old plants that were been removed from the field. And they won't feed on that. So they're just eating the green part. And then they will eat wheat if there's if the once the brome starts dying down, they'll transition into anything that's green. And lots of times. That's right about now or later, hopefully, when we've planted wheat. It'll, the wheat will start growing, and they'll start feeding on that green growth in the wheat. For those with waterways, for instance, near those wheat fields, that's a concern about those worms harboring in that waterway, isn't it? It is. They move out. Uh, they look for anything green. Once they once anything starts to die down, uh, they move out and start feeding on anything green. They have done a pretty good number on a lot of volunteer wheat fields because they don't care whether it's domestic wheat that we planted or volunteer wheat that just came up on its own. Anything green, they will infest and they will use utilize as a food source. One of the other questions I've been getting lately is if we use an insecticide-treated seed at planting time, will that control the worms? And generally speaking, the caterpillars, the Lepidopterus larvae, which is what we're talking about when we talk about army worms or fall army worms, they're not affected very much by seed treatments. Those seed treatments do a really good job on Asian fly and aphids, but again, only for 21 to 28 days. So we do not recommend using an insecticide treated seed to try and manage or control any of the worms. The best thing is to manage them by planting as late as you possibly can. I, I, we always stress that, but the best management planting dates for wheat are as late as possible. The agronomy department does a really good job, I think, of putting out a, a map of Kansas with the ideal planting dates for yields or for economic purposes. And from pest management standpoint, the later you can hold off planting, the better off you are. Uh, to help avoid any of our pests or diseases, fashion fly, grasshoppers, any of the worms, the later, the better. Now, as far as these army worms and fall army worms go, as of last week, they looked to me like they were about mature larvae. So they will look for a place, and that's why you see them crawling across old sidewalks or roads or someplace they're heading for a site to pupate in. They pupate in loose soil, cracks, crevices in the the ground under thatch. They'll take four to five days to pupate. They will emerge as a moth after four or five days. They will mate. They will lay eggs. Eggs will take another four or five days to hatch. So if you plant it right now, you've got about 10 days without any army worm egg laying going on in that field. Now, that remember, that's a generality because mm-hmm. every place is a little bit different. But if you were out planting, you got 10 days, those plants start germinating and all those moths are out. They've already laid their eggs. They didn't lay their eggs on your green wheat because there wasn't any green wheat there. They look for sites with greenery because that's what the larvae need to survive on. So... That's why I say the later you can hold off planting, generally speaking, the better off you are to help manage or just miss the largest flight of of these moths. It's much better than trying to spray for them. Some of the guys have sprayed their brome. Once you get so many worms and they're decimating the greenery, they've gotten out and sprayed and they've done a pretty good job of cleaning them up. And from what I've heard, takes 36, 48 hours later after you've treated them for that brome patch to start greening up and coming back. So they were most, most of the folks that I've talked to pretty happy with a treatment. But again, they shouldn't kill out the brome patch. They should just feed on it because they're grazers. And brome is a perennial, so it should just keep coming back after that. And one of the other things you say is coming up are these army worms 
a threat to alfalfa stands as they're starting to fade in their growth heading into the dormant period. Same thing with alfalfa. Uh, I've gotten several calls about uh, worms and alfalfa, and as you know, we're getting to the point where a lot of producers are trying to decide whether to treat or whether to swath right now or just let it go going into the winter. If you do have a serious army worm or fall army worm or beet army worm infestation in your alfalfa and it's within a week of swathing, I would recommend going ahead and cut it instead of spraying it. Uh, We have seen a couple of fields earlier this year that had pretty serious infestations of, of fall army worms and army worms. They were all swathed, and the birds attacked the worms, and the worms didn't come back. And the regrowth uh, came back pretty quickly. So I'm hoping that instead of spraying right now, if you just swath it, if it's, if, like I said, if it's in with about a week of swathing, just swath it. I don't think you'll have a problem with the uh, army worms coming back. Next week, Jeff, we want to have you back for just in brief noting here. You say we have a few issues in soybeans that bear monitoring. We have uh, seen some problems with grasshoppers. You know, we've had quite a few grasshoppers this year. We're also seeing stink bugs um, that have hatched earlier, and they're becoming a little more prolific around soybeans. So probably something we ought to visit about. Indeed. We'll do so next week as we catch up with you once again. Thanks for giving us the lowdown on that multitude of army worms out there and the potential threats to our field crops. Appreciate your time as always. My pleasure. Thank you very much, Eric. That from Research and Extension Crop Entomologist, K-State, Jeff Whitworth. You're listening to Agriculture Today. We're back now on Agriculture Today. Eric Atkinson with you. And once more, we turn to an individual from the Farm Service Agency State Headquarters for Kansas. This is the segment we refer to as FSA Coffee Talk. And get the latest in this case on the USDA's loan programs and a specific option available to you producers. Josh Ritter is the Farm Loan Chief with the Kansas FSA. We have discussed the various loan programs that your shop administers before, Josh, but you want to expand today on a loan program for grain storage purposes. Tell us more about it. Yeah, FSA administers a loan program specifically for grain storage, which is our Farm Storage Facility Loan, or FSFL, program. This program is intended to be used by producers to help them store, handle, and or transport eligible commodities they produce. Most commonly, the FSFL program is used for storage structures such as grain bins and grain distribution systems. But in addition, the program can also be used for the following purposes. Hay storage structures, bulk tanks for milk storage, cold storage for meat, eggs, or fruits and vegetables, and also portable equipment used to handle eligible commodities, which would include augers, grain carts, hay wagons, baggers, unloaders, and storage and handling trucks, including semi-trucks, grain trucks and semi-trailers like grain hoppers, et cetera. Important information there. It's more than just grain bins, what these loans can support. Who is eligible to utilize the program? And uh, while talking about that, what are some of the main requirements here? I think the first thing to point out about this program is that the commodity that the producer wants to store must be an eligible commodity. Luckily for us in Kansas, eligible commodities include hay and most grains commonly raised in our state, such as wheat, corn, soybeans, and milo. Other eligible commodities would include fruits and vegetables, meat, eggs, and milk. Another thing to keep in mind is that the person or entity applying for the loan must be the producer of the eligible commodity. This program is not authorized for commercial storage, so FSA will complete a storage calculation to verify that the applicant shows a need for the storage structure based on reported production acres. For grain storage, we can consider the applicant's storage needs for two years of production. Cold storage, which would include fruits, vegetables, meats, milk, etc., is limited to one year of storage needs. Now, there are, you say, financial requirements for the producer applying for the loan to satisfy under this uh, facility storage loan program, right? Yeah, and we've previously discussed that most FSA loan programs have a requirement that the applicants are not able to obtain the needed credit from a commercial lender. But that's not a requirement for this uh, farm storage facility loan program. 
FSA can make a facility loan to an applicant that has resources necessary to obtain a loan from a commercial lender. Um, as part of our financial review, FSA is required to review the applicant's current balance sheet, and that's to verify that the applicant has the resources available to make the required down payment. And in addition, we'll analyze a typical year cash flow projection to ensure that that applicant can make the annual payment on the loan. Always of interest, what are the terms of the loans, including interest, of course? You might run through those. Sure. Yeah, the maximum loan amount is $500,000 for each loan. So applicants can have multiple loans provided they show the storage need and can show repayment ability for those loans. Applicants are required to make a down payment of 15% of the total cost of the structure or equipment. And there is a possibility for a slightly lower down payment requirement on small loans of $50,000 or less. The available terms for FSFO loans are 3, 5, 7, 10, or 12 years. The loan term corresponds with the loan amount, so smaller loans are amortized for a shorter time, and larger loans offer a longer amortization period. And the interest rate under this program are established each month, so the interest rate for each loan is the rate in effect at the time of loan approval and is fixed for the term of the loan. Currently, the interest rates are very low. For example, for loans approved in September, A three-year term carries an interest rate of 0.375%, and a 12-year term has an interest rate of 1.375%. So once again, those terms are to encourage participation, to be certain. There is some form or level of security required for obtaining one of these loans, one would assume. Yeah, and the security requirements depend upon the aggregate outstanding loan amount which really means that we have to consider any outstanding principal balances on existing FSFL loans and the amount of the new loan request when we're determining what security will be required. So for aggregate amounts of $100,000 or less, a lien will be required on whatever is being purchased with the facility loan. For example, if the applicant is purchasing a grain bin, then we'll require a lien on the grain bin being purchased to meet our security requirements. For aggregate amounts over $100,000, A lien on attractive real estate is required in addition to the lien being taken on whatever is being purchased with the loan funds. As an alternative to a lien on the structure or a lien on real estate, we do offer the option that the applicant can provide an irrevocable letter of credit from their lending institution. If an irrevocable letter of credit is received, then that satisfies the security requirement for the FSFL loan. Right. And are there any application fees associated with the loan program then? Yeah, there is a non-refundable application fee of $100 that is charged for each FSFL application. In addition, if the loan is secured by real estate, the applicant would be required to pay for an appraisal if needed and all costs associated with title work, mortgage filings, and, and all those sorts of things. Once more, all of this is put together to entice producers to go ahead and construct whatever storage facilities they're looking into for their operations. So how does one who's interested in the loan program launch that application process? Sure. And I want to point out that Kansas has regionalized the delivery of of this program. So we have four offices in the state that are primarily responsible for administering the program. However, I would recommend that interested individuals contact their local office And then that local FSA office will be able to assist the producer along with the regional offices to make it as easy a process as possible. So make that local contact at your FSA headquarters. And a few finer details here, and and one is a a very key issue you want to remind folks about. Yeah, I want potential applicants to keep in mind that FSFL loans must be approved before any site preparation and or construction can be started. So all loan requests are subject to an environmental evaluation and accepting delivery of equipment or starting any site preparation or construction before loan approval may impede the successful completion of that environmental evaluation and may adversely affect loan eligibility. So with that in mind, we recommend that anybody interested in this program contact FSA early in the planning stages. This will help us ensure that all environmental regulations are followed correctly and will also give us a chance to help producers with the application process to make sure everything goes as smooth as it can. Very well. Well, that is a quick rundown on the USDA's Farm Storage Facility Loan Program, and it's put together to be of good appeal to producers who have a storage space need, be it for grain, be it for other commodities. Look into it, and the starting point for doing that would be your local FSA counter. Talk with those folks. Josh, thanks for the update on a very important opportunity for producers. Thank you, Eric. Have a good day. You as well. Farm Loan Chief with the Farm Service Agency, State Office for Kansas. That's Josh Ritter.
Taking us up to the break, word on another USDA program, which was recently expanded to help drought-impacted livestock producers recover some of the costs associated with transporting feed due to poor grazing conditions. The USDA's Rod Bain fills us in. It is one of the programs available from the Agriculture Department to help livestock producers in the West and Great Plains mitigate the impacts of severe drought conditions. The Emergency Livestock Assistance Program called ELAP. And Agriculture Secretary Tom Vilsack recently explained during a White House press briefing that through ELAP... Historically, we've always provided resources to farmers to be able to pay for the cost of hauling water to their facilities. If they had a situation with a drought and they needed to access additional water, there's a cost associated with that and we helped to defer some of that expense. Now, new adjustments at ELAP will also cover costs for the transport of feed for drought-impacted livestock that rely on grazing. We know that these farmers, particularly in the western U.S., are going to be confronted with having to truck or rail feed from far distances, and that's going to be an incredibly increased cost to them. So we're going to use this emergency program to provide up to 60 percent of the additional costs that they're incurring above and beyond what they would normally incur for transportation expense. And for limited resource farmers, it could be as much as 90 percent of assistance and help. ELAP is under the Farm Service Agency suite of programs. FSA Administrator Zach Ducheneau explains some of the logistics involved with ELAP covering feed transportation costs of eligible producers. This will trigger when the drought intensity is D2 for eight consecutive weeks or that drought intensity is D3 on the drought monitor. Or if USDA determines a shortage of local or regional feed availability. Additional details on how feed transportation cost assistance is determined include... A formula which will be established by the FSA and the USDA will be used to determine those reimbursement costs. We won't include the first 25 miles. We won't include distances over 1,000 miles because we have to have some type of cap on it. But we'll help producers figure out what that difference is and make a payment based on that amount. Cost share assistance will also be made available to cover eligible cost in treating hay or feed to prevent spread of invasive pests like fire ants. Another eligibility requirement, producers must have incurred feed transportation cost after January 1st of this year. Applications for payment under this provision of ELAP must be submitted to local FSA offices by no later than January 30th, 2022. I'm Rod Bain reporting for the U.S. Department of Agriculture in Washington, D.C. And we'll return shortly with today's agricultural news headlines and more for you here on Agriculture Today. Now in its 97th year of service to agriculture, this is the K-State Radio Network, and you're listening to Agriculture Today. Eric Atkinson here. Now today's agricultural news headlines for you, courtesy in part of DTN. While little is known about how the Biden administration will rewrite the waters of the United States or WOTUS rules, EPA Administrator Michael Regan says that exemptions for farming and ranching activities would remain in place. In addition, Regan told state agriculture regulators that the agency is hoping to have a proposed rule reflecting pre-2015 definitions out for public comment by sometime in November, with a rewrite proposal out for comment sometime this coming winter. Now, Regan was speaking at the National Association of State Departments of Agriculture this week when he made these comments. Since 1993, federal regulations have included an exclusion from jurisdiction for prior converted croplands. Regan said the forthcoming rule will propose retaining that exclusion. The Clean Water Act also exempts discharges allowed associated with normal farming, ranching, and forestry activities such as plowing, cultivating, drainage, and harvesting for food, fiber, and forest production or on upland soil and water conservation practices. Regan said that EPA's goal is to write a new rule that will bring clarity for farmers and ranchers. 
And he said the new proposed rule would maintain all agricultural exemptions, including minor drainage, as well as the construction and maintenance of irrigation ditches. Regan said the new rule would not overburden or penalize farmers while protecting water quality. African swine fever has spread to Haiti. As the World Organization for Animal Health has confirmed an outbreak there, the OIE report the first indication that the virus may have spread from the Dominican Republic, where it was identified in the Western Hemisphere for the first time in decades. This report indicates there were 234 cases of ASF found among a backyard herd of about 2,500 animals in Haiti. The report indicated the origin of the infection is either unknown or inconclusive. The USDA's Animal Health Inspection Service announced this week it had shut off the flow of pork products from Puerto Rico and the U.S. Virgin Islands, while the U.S. government sets up a system to prevent the spread of the virus to the mainland U.S. The OIE said the Haitians are taking several steps in response, including surveillance, quarantine, and screening additional animals in the region. Officials are preparing to take additional steps of establishing protection zones, controlling movement of pigs inside that country, and other measures. Now, at the end of last week, the USDA had suspended the movement of all live swine, swine germplasm, pork products, and swine byproducts from Puerto Rico and the Virgin Islands to the U.S. mainland in an effort to prevent the spread of ASF. So far, it has not been detected in either of those locations. The Animal and Plant Health Inspection Service back in July confirmed ASF in the Dominican Republic, and a USDA official said earlier in August that the U.S. was trying to accelerate efforts to eradicate feral hogs in Puerto Rico and to expand testing efforts in Haiti and the Dominican Republic. Are the current low interest rates on farm loans expected to remain? Well, one official has more to say about that in this report from Gary Crawford. Of course, farmers today depend on credit and are dependent on reasonable interest rates. And the good news on that is this. Right now, ag producers are experiencing some of the lowest interest rates they've ever experienced in, uh, since we've been measuring, really, farm uh, finances. And he should know he's Jackson Takash, chief economist for Farmer Mac, and he told an Outlook forum put on by AgriPulse this week that not only are interest rates very low, but if you look at how many cents out of every dollar a farmer earns that gets eaten up in interest payments, it was 35 cents back during the farm crisis of the 80s. Today we're at something more like 10 to 12 cents. Very uh, modest levels, very manageable levels. And I think our new normal is going to be right around that 13 cents to 15 cents mark. So we're going to hold that level uh, given where interest rates are and the outlook for interest rates. And hear this. Jackson Takash says even though current interest rates are really low, farmers in the next few months might see yet another decline. But it's going to be a lot smaller than some of the more dramatic de- decreases we've seen over the last, say, 12 to 24 months. This is Gary Crawford reporting for the U.S. Department of Agriculture. A group of 87 ethanol and grain companies who are members of Growth Energy sent a letter to President Biden calling for his support of the renewable fuel standard, the ethanol industry, awaiting the release of proposed RFS volumes for 2021 and 22, and possibly a proposal to reduce volumes from 2020. In that letter, the company said they have continued to work through a number of obstacles to keep their businesses profitable. They said ethanol should be part of a strategy to reduce greenhouse gas emissions in transportation fuels because ethanol reduces carbon emissions by 46 percent compared to fossil fuels. They said a recent analysis concludes that if we're to achieve net zero by 2050, quoting them, we must use all the tools in the toolbox, including biofuels. Companies are asking Biden to assure that the RFS volumes for conventional biofuels remain at 15 billion gallons and to restore 500 million gallons of fuel blending requirements for advanced and cellulosic biofuels. Well, nine state beef councils joined together recently to showcase beef on a national stage. Scarlett Higgins tells us here numerous culinary enthusiasts were able to enjoy various recipes and learn more about how beef is produced. 
the Kansas, Florida, Iowa, Nebraska, Ohio, Oklahoma, South Dakota, Tennessee, and Texas Beef Councils partnered to sponsor the 2021 American Culinary Federation National Convention held in Orlando, Florida last month. The event drew nearly 700 professional chefs, students, and culinary instructors from across the country. As part of the checkoff sponsorship, attendees were greeted at the welcome reception by the Beef It's What's For Dinner station featuring Baja beef tacos made with grilled Terrace Major. This provided an opportunity for the Beef It's What's For Dinner team, including Kansas Beef Council Director of Marketing Charla Huseman, to engage with chefs and showcase an innovative beef product. Beef It's What's For Dinner also had a presence in the trade show where attendees could interact with staff and pick up materials such as food service cut charts, beef marbling posters, and handouts explaining the beef life cycle. Additionally, pop-up stations featuring samples of Mexican-style beef sausage cornbread muffins, deviled eggs with sliced tri-tip, and buffalo-style beef bites were available between sessions. Beef short ribs were at the center of the plate for the President's Grand Ball, the final event of the meeting. Sponsoring the American Culinary Federation National Convention and distributing beef industry facts has been important, especially in the last few years, as meat alternative groups attempt to infiltrate the food service market. I'm Scarlett Hagens. And that's a quick recap of today's agricultural news. Gus Vanderhoven is in next. You're tuned to Agriculture Today. This is Agriculture Today. Stop, look, and listen. This is our state. Kansas. I pass the wild plum and pick the higher fruit. That's Gus Vanderhoven of Kansas State University with comment on life in rural Kansas. It was a nice, crisp morning, the kind of morning I associate with autumn, the fall season. Going down the driveway, I noticed the tall grasses and flowers along the side. Their golden rods and the thistle I really like and look for it each fall. It is the tall thistle, also called roadside thistle. I like that name, as it grows along the side of my driveway. Bees and butterflies were hanging around and visiting the flowers. When it's not sticky hot, it's fun to get the mail and look at what is blooming. I see the first small asters. Also, the rough dogwood has started to change color. The leaves are turning purple, and the fruit, the white berries, are pronounced. On the farm, I pass the wild plum and pick the higher fruit. We can still have warm, hot days, but the nights are getting cooler, and so are the early mornings. I love this time of the year. I notice the tall blue stem I watch each year is six feet tall. It's a clump along the driveway I know and recognize where it stands. Now I will walk the trail on the hill and look for the clump where many years ago a friend took a photo while I stood next to it with Martin, then a baby, in a back carrier. I'm pulling the tall grass with turkey foot over while he is grabbing for it. A happy baby sitting high. That was a long time ago. He is 44 years now. Other grasses prominent are the plumed Indian grass. There's purple love grass and foxtails. I see Annika and my wife select and cut to make bouquets. As you slowly walk, the ungraced prairie like on my hill, it is amazing what all grows there. It used to frustrate me that I did not always instantly know the name of the plant and everything that I had to know about it. I've learned and have allowed myself to simply enjoy. You cannot know everything, and you surely should not pretend you do. It's one reason I value my book so much with all the resources. Maybe you use Google on the computer. Flowers, leaves, and ripe fruit are telling us 
fall is upon us, but so are the fresh spider webs woven across the trails. The other morning, when I was driving by a harvested cornfield, I noticed a flock of Canadian geese hunkered down, resting and grazing. Now, that is a sign of autumn. I slowed the truck down. I looked at the flock of birds. They were on their way south, but found a good and safe place to rest and feed. The geese seemed to be in no hurry. So, from now on, the yard work can also slow down. The lawn won't grow back so fast, if it grows back at all. Soon, one last mowing will do it. It feels so good not to be in a hurry the rest of this season. My big fall job is to clear and clean out the shed. I must organize the lumber I have stored there. I have to reorganize the space. It is a good shed. It stores a lot. True, some pack rats try to make it home also, and they are not welcome. On the farm, the cows have been taken off the grass, one cow short. Before I have walked the draws to look if a cow had died when we were short. Before they have found the lost one at the neighbors, just as we have had numbers with neighbors' cows on our property. It's not that the fences are bad. It's because some cows just like it better on the other side. They would be coming back this weekend to look. I hope they find her, or else... When the neighbors pull the cows off, they will call. Hey, we have one of your cows. Then sometimes this fall, one-third range will be burnt again. We now fall as patch burning, and we are back to the very first patch. Then when the smoke hangs over the hills and settles over the draws, I for a moment think it is spring. But it's not. We burn in the fall, and it seems to work, at least for us. And when spring comes... I have to remind my neighbors that I've already burned and to please control their burn. But look at all the days which have to come first. We have Thanksgiving and the holidays. Then comes winter with freezes and snow. I hope good snows this winter. And when it is winter, we will be burning wood in the fireplace. There's plenty of good wood dried and neatly stacked. I'll throw a tarp over the stack of wood so that it stays dry. Just think, a good fire and a good book. The tough thing right now is that family was planning to come this fall, but they can't enter the country. It's because of the COVID virus. We surely hope that by Christmas the borders are open. I know we can talk about this, but we all need to be vaccinated. But I'll be honest. In my own extended family, there are different opinions. As a state, a country, a world, we must get on top of this. I will get my flu shot. I am an old man, but life is too good. I like to celebrate more beautiful Kansas autumns. Gus Vanderhoven of Kansas State University with his weekly commentary on life in rural Kansas. That'll do it for our Wednesday edition, but this advance notice in a couple of weeks, Agriculture Today will be undergoing a slight change in what you hear each weekday, something of a shorter version, but nonetheless still loaded up with information that we hope and believe will remain of great interest and value to all of you in production agriculture and in allied ventures. You'll continue to hear several of the standard features you're accustomed to, and as this transition continues, likely some new things as well. This ever so slightly new format begins a week from this Monday. We hope you'll find it to your liking. In the meantime, thanks for tuning in today. We're looking forward to having you right back here with us tomorrow. Until then, Eric Atkinson for Agriculture Today over the K-State Radio Network.